Welcome. Hello. Is this working? Welcome, everybody. A good night. Thanks for coming uh, tonight to this uh, event uh, on experimental preservation. This is quite uh, an extraordinary event, not only because of the uh, caliber of the speakers that are joining us, but also because of the various uh, institutions uh, that have come together to, to organize it. Uh, in thinking about the question of experimental preservation, uh, this is, we, we, we came to realize that this was really a global discussion, a global conversation. So the, the conversation has been happening now for some time, but it's been really spurred by, um, by a collaboration between institutions worldwide, and in particular between Columbia University and the Oslo School of Architecture, uh, some of you are here from the Oslo School of Architecture, and I'll be introducing some of the co-organizers of this uh, uh, more, more in depth as we go along, but I just want to signal Eric uh, Langdalen, who is the director of the Institute for History, Theory, and Form of the Oslo School of Architecture, and Turdis Arrhenius, who is the professor at the Oslo uh, School of Architecture, who are the uh, co-organizers of this event, and also Studio X Istanbul, who is also co-organizing uh, the event. So we're very much brought together, um, uh, uh, all these series of institutions around this question of experimental preservation. Uh, there have been, this is the um, fourth, fourth and a half actually, conversation. <laughs> Uh, around the question of experimental preservation because we initiated this, um, this series of conferences. Uh, we, we tried to find a, find a number of excuses like the 10th anniversary of Future Anterior was one excuse that, that we came up with, um, but certainly the 50th anniversary of the Historic Preservation Program, which this event initiates all the series of events that will take place this week and that will culminate with the uh, Fitch Colloquium on Saturday, which we are all invited to from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. Hope to see you there. The question of experimental preservation is really a question about um, what is the creative content of preservation. We teach preservation uh, across the world now. It's been a very successful discipline. It's very established. And preservation is an art and a science. But we often teach preservation as if it's just a science. And in fact, the more you go into the science of preservation, the more you go into the material science, the conservation of, uh, of preservation, the more you realize what an art it is. And so part of this question about experimental preservation was to think about what is the creative content of preservation? What are the aesthetics of preservation? And what are the places in which this sort of questioning of the practice and opening of the discipline is happening through aesthetic practices? So we began a series of conversations that took place first in Oslo, then at the Venice Biennale, uh, and then uh, we had another conference in, uh, in uh, LA that Bryani Roberts organized and we decided was another experimental preservation conference uh, sort of during the conference um, and then this, this conference now. Um, inviting people from various disciplines who are working with heritage in one way or another in an aesthetic way and so uh, irrespective of their discipline of origin to ask the question of them, you know, what is experimental preservation? And the question of, ex of experimentalism is, is, a, is precisely this idea that we, don't have, that we don't have the answers and that we're willing to test the boundaries of the discipline. And in doing so, we've come to realize that, in, that there is a moment now uh, in various disciplines, in architecture and in art, in which uh, the site of production of, of creativity in those disciplines has, has shifted from traditional context. So for example, just as you had interior architecture and landscape architecture, now you have preservation architecture. So the, the sort of site, 
the object of, preser uh, of, of creativity in architecture has shifted. And also in art, where you had museum art, then gallery art, then landscape art, now we have a number of art, art, artists who are working very much uh, with historic buildings as the site of their production. Um, and they are l moving from one historic site to another in order to advance their uh, the, the questions and aesthetic practices. So they're interested in questions of historical significance, of cultural relevance. They're interested in questions of memory. Uh, they're interested in questions of conflict uh, production and resolution, and they're uh, addressing them and, uh, and bringing attention to them through their various practices. So we bring together this group here into a conversation. The idea is to have a discussion both amongst ourselves and with you about what um, this new emerging form of practice is that, that we are tentatively calling experimental preservation. Uh, so you're, very, you're all very much welcome to, to join the conversation. The format for the evening is going to be a series of very short presentations from each of our uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, and then we are going to be uh, uh, following up with a, uh, we're gonna all sit at the table and uh, Tordis Arrhenius and Eric Langdalen are going to be uh, offering a first response to, to, the, uh, to the presentations. And then we're going to have a, a conversation. And uh, again, you're, please, please per, uh, consider yourselves a part of the uh, conversation and not an audience, because this is, of course, set up to be a sort of auditorium. But we want you to be listening and participating. Um, we, I will be introducing each of the speakers separately, but let me just uh, tell you um, who they are. Azra Escamilla, Alex Lerner, uh, David Gisson and Typhoon Sirtas. Um, um, Typhoon is going to be speaking first. He's going to be speaking um, in, in Turkish and is going to have a translator, although he understands English, so we can have a conversation. Uh, uh, you might, I'm not sure if you will also translate from English into Turkish, but anyway, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, uh, uh, we'll work around that uh, as best we can. So again, thank you to Studio X Istanbul, thank you to uh, GSAPP, thank you to AHU for beginning to stage this, this global conversation uh, about uh, preservation. Um, so I'll begin by introducing Typhoon. Typhoon Sertas is an artist based in Istanbul uh, and Bodrum. He was trained in social anthropology and then did a master's in art. His practice investigates uh, minorities and the city. And he does this by focusing on the cultural heritage of the other. And of course, what constitutes the other? So he is very much looking at this tension of you know, minorities and majorities sort of looking at each other as, as the other. He engages in a critique of civil society through his work by foregrounding the sociology of everyday life and pr these exchanges between minority cultures and majority cultures. Um, he did an amazing installation at uh, Studio X Istanbul in which he collected, you will be showing it, I hope, um, all the, uh, the corner stones with the names of the architects of buildings around Istanbul from the uh, 19th century, which showed it to be such a cosmopolitan place, very much in contrast with some of the ways in which uh, uh, some uh, members of uh, Turkish society represent the history of, uh, of the city. Um, he does, so in his practice, he engages buildings very much as the site of his work. He looks at buildings and ur urban uh, settings as ready-mades. So he draws upon this tradition of, of, of uh, the ready-made in art, but then expands the category to include the city and include, um, and include architecture. And I think this is very interesting from, for, for this question of creativity because in architecture we constantly think about the creative content of architecture as making a new building. But could there be a creative approach to architecture that incorporates buildings as ready-mades? And then what would that creative content be? His interest is to look at these buildings as ready-mades as a way to unpack questions of collective memory. And his visual language explores preservation as the intersection 
of social sciences and contemporary art. So he brings us training to bear uh, into his practice. And what you're gonna see today is people that were trained in one discipline and that operate in this emerging field of experimental preservation. So there's very much sort of collecting of different, um, different disciplinary knowledges that are going about in, in, this, in this process of creating this, this, uh, this, new, um, this new practice. And in that, we have to ask, you know, what is, as the disciplines in the university are beginning to disaggregate and new formations are beginning to form, and you see that with the creation of institutes that are sort of the light infantry of disciplines, right? They're sort of question marks. Could this be a discipline? Uh, and they pull together different parts of the university, like the Institute for Data Sciences, for example, that was just started here. Um, the question is, what is relevant knowledge? So since we don't have an institute for experimental preservation, although that wouldn't that be wonderful, maybe the ACT <laughs> at, at MIT might be uh, as close as it gets. Um, then, then part of the question we will be thinking about today are, are what, are the, what is the relevant knowledge that is brought to bear in this practice? And so it is, it is with, with that in mind that it gives me great pleasure to welcome Typhoon Sirtis. başlayabiliriz zannediyorum. Kasım 2011'de İstanbul Studio X'in aslında ilk solo şovu olan projemden bahsedeceğim. So he will be talking about uh, the first uh, solo show uh, at Studio X at uh, November 10 uh, this this year, next uh, last year. Mimarlar mezarlığı kısaca İstanbul'da 19. yüzyılın son çeyreğinde ortaya çıkmış bir mimar grubunu ele alıyor. So the cemetery of uh, architects is is, uh, is is looking at the the last quarter of uh, the, the first quarter of 19th century. And last quarter of the 19th century, uh, architects. Uh, bizim için kritik bir tarih. Bu, bu grup mimarları anlamadı. So 18, 1800, 1870 is a crucial date for us to şey oldu. There were like three important um, things happened uh, at um, 18, uh, 1870. Uh, Tanzimat fermanı ile birlikte um, azınlıkların farklı meslek dallarında uh, faaliyet gösterebilmeleri serbestisi verildi. So with the Tanzimat, the reform, reformation uh, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, the minorities were given more uh, opportunity to, to do uh, their professions and architecture. Uh, Osmanlı dönemi artık Osmanlı İmparatorluğu artık dağılma dönemine girmişti ve o dönemde son çare olarak batılılaşma bütün bir devlet politikası haline geldi. And at that time Ottoman Empire was already uh, like uh, dissolving <coughs> and uh, the, the westernization was seen as the last resort to keep the uh, empire together. Ve İstanbullu azınlıkların yoğunlaştığı büyük e, Pera dediğimiz bölgede Beyoğlu dediğimiz bölgede 1870'te büyük Pera yangını gerçekleşti. And this place called Pera in Istanbul Uh, it was a place that the minority minority groups are mostly living in. Uh, there's a big fire happened in Pera Hotel. Ve e, bu yangından boşalan arazilere artık daha dayanıklı konutlar yapma ihtiyacı doğdu. And the remaining areas after this uh, big uh, fire, and uh, there, there's a the need of uh, building more resistant and like more um, better buildings. Bu üç süreç. E, 
aslında o güne kadar ki bütün bir mimari geleneğin dışında yeni bir mimar tipinin doğmasına yol açtı. So these three events, like reform and the fire and the, the, all of the um, privileges for given to minorities give gave rise to all the the, the instruction construction of this new architectural style. Uh, bu gruptaki mimarlar hiçbir zaman devlet tarafından desteklenmediler. And these architects that we're talking about, they never got uh, support from the government. The hiçbir zaman anıtsal yapılar yapmadılar. And they never built historical buildings. Anıtsal yapılar yapan Alexander Valeri, Fosatiler, Balyanlar gibi zaten saray tarafından desteklenen büyük mimarlar hiçbir zaman binalara imza atmadılar. And like the, the big architects who built uh, the palaces, uh, like uh, the names that he told, um, they were never uh, put their, they never put their names onto the buildings and they were not individual architects. Orta sınıf diyebileceğimiz yeni bir mimari sınıf yaratarak aslında sadece sivil apartmanlar yaptılar. Sivil so like by this way, verdiler. they create a, a middle class sort of uh, architecture, uh, architects, and then they only gave the, they were only be able to build uh, apartment buildings, not historical or official institutions uh, kind of buildings. Mm -hmm. Uh, basitçe yeni zenginlere aslında yeni zenginlerin konut ihtiyacını karşılıyorlardı. Bizim için burada önemli olan ise aslında ilk defa bu mimar grubuyla birlikte birey olarak mimar kimliğini izleyebiliyorduk. But this is the first time that we observe an individual architect uh, coming up in the history of the Turkish architecture because the other ones who were building who were working in palaces they never put their names onto the uh, buildings or the, the things that they built. Uh, saray mimarları geniş kalabalık bazen 40-50 kişilik gruplar olarak çalışıyorlardı. And these uh, architects that work in the palaces, they were working in groups of 40-50 architects together. Ve uh, onların bireyselleşme süreçleri hiçbir zaman bu mimarlar gibi olmadı diyebiliriz kısaca. And, and they could not, uh, they, they didn't have an individual uh, place as these architects that we're talking about. Uh, Cumhuriyet sonrası bu uh, gruptaki mimarların İstanbul'a bıraktıkları aslında mimari stok ya da mimari miras mm -hmm. uh, başkentin Ankara'ya taşınması ile birlikte uh, farklı biçimde ele alınmaya başladı. So this heritage that we're looking at in Istanbul uh, is totally changed after the, the built the, built the, the, the Turkish Republic uh, started and uh, the capital was transferred to, to Ankara and then a totally new architecture uh, style uh, started there. Birinci ulusal mimari akımının oluşmasıyla aslında bu mimarların geleninden miras almayı reddeden yeni bir modernizm kuruldu mimari üzerine. And a new modernism uh, was built by this first national architecture movement after the Republic and it was this, this architect group was uh, uh, was ignored so they didn't uh, follow this modernism that coming from the western but they, instead they built their own uh, the national modernism ve bu insanların çoğu mesleki kariyerlerinin zirvesindeyken işsiz kaldılar and these people end up being jobless and homeless that time çünkü uh, yeni başkent Ankara'ydı mm -hmm. yeni ekonomi Ankara üzerine şekilleniyordu ve uh, yeni akımın mimarları onlar gibi çalışmıyordu zaten. Yeah, the new economy and the new modernism was the Ankara, the capital of the city. Uh, bu grup mimarların yapısı tonun yoğunlaştığı bölgelerden biri olarak Tarlabaşı bizim için bir örnek. So Tarlabaşı is like uh, you can see many examples of these type of uh, buildings. Uh, 80'li yıllardan itibaren Tarlabaşı sistemli olarak yıkılmaya başladı. Starting by the 19, 1980s, uh, the Tarlabaşı started to be uh, demolished systemically by the government. Burada aynı dönem aslında Avrupa'da gördüğümüz yapıların İstanbul'a uyarlanmış e, bir İstanbul Art Deco'su, İstanbul Art Nouveau'su gibi bir aslında İstanbul neoklasizminden bahsedilebilir bu mahallede. So we can talk about an Istanbul neoclassicism and Art Deco uh, that is kind of transferred from the uh, western uh, uh, architectural styles uh, here. Aynı dönemde zaten mahalle demografik olarak da e, gücünü kaybetmişti. And demographically, this, these places were inhabited by the minorities, but it is also uh, having a transition to uh, the minorities were diminishing from this uh, area. En büyük yıkım 86'da dalan döneminde gerçekleşti yol açma bahanesiyle. 
and like this was like done in 1986 to open an additional roads. Ve 86 dan sonra bu mimari e, mirasın diyelim ya da bu yapı stoğunun olduğu bölge aslında tamamen getto olarak kaderine terk edildi. And this heritage became became a ghetto area after that actually. Burada genel evlerin ne kadar zaten boş kaldığını ve yeni sahiplerin olmadığı. And you can see that these these are empty. They don't they're not live people are not living in these buildings anymore. Ve kısa sürede Anadolu'dan göç eden ya da uh, Afrika'dan ya da çeşitli ülkelerden Türkiye'ye İstanbul'a göç eden göçmenlerin yaşadığı ucuz konut uh, ihtiyacını gideren bir bölgeye dönüştü. And, and became a place uh, for people who are immigrating from the east like to Turkey and Africa and like mainly really cheap uh, living areas. Uh, yarım asır kadar önce aslında İstanbul Levantenlerinin en uh, ünlü mahallesinden bahsediyoruz. But this was the, the most elite and uh, one of the most elite areas back then, back in the times coming from the Levant area. Uh, son yıkım 2010 yılında uh, 2009 yılında karar verildikten sonra 2010'da başladı. So the, the, the final demolition started around 2009 and demolishing it right now when they're building replicates and, and building residence halls and office places instead Çünkü of these buildings. And this is really economically very like important place. It's just in the center of the downtown area in Istanbul. Uh, so um, Typhoon is collecting um, these inscriptions for 10 years, like photographing them. Çünkü aslında onların bir sanat eseri gibi yaptıkları binaya e, isimlerini yazmalarıydı benim benim açımdan hiç çarpıcı olan. I mean, as an artistic view, he was interested in like how they put their names onto the buildings uh, that they built. Bunlar çok basit örnekler ve aslında bunun dışında hiçbir şey bilmiyoruz. Mesela Parraç ve Clonaride bir company kuruyorlar ve engineer architect. Yani e, so ama bununla ilgili bildiğimiz daha fazlası yok. Yeah, we don't know too much about these. So we all we know that these two guys, Parraç Faraci and uh, his, you know, they build a company together, which is uh, architecture company, and that's all we know about it. We don't Ve have any fontlar, more. Kullandıkları fontlar bir şekilde aslında mimariyle olan ilişkilerinde e, yansıtıyor. And these fonts that they're using is also showing the the connection to the architecture. Proje aslında tarla başı projesinin bir cevap olarak çıktı. So this was the project was a response to the tarla başı project, the demolition project. Replika neoklasik binalar yapabilirlerdi. Uh, they could have done neoklasik uh, replicates of this Ama buildings. Ama hiç zaman mimarlar olmayacaktı. O yüzden ben de mimarların replikalarını yapmaya başladım. And he started ma making the replicates of uh, these uh, inscriptions. Burada üç aşamada aslında ne yaptığımı görüyorsunuz. Fotoğrafını çekiyorum, vektörel olarak baştan aynısını birebir çiziyorum ve akabinde mermer uyguluyorum. So this is the processes that he made. He first took the photographs. And then he made a vectoral drawing of it, and then he actually like create the actual marble, uh, put them onto the marble. Ama mimar yazıtları o kadar şanslı değil. And like the, some of the uh, architects' inscri inscriptions are not that lucky. Çünkü bina üzerindeki birçok mimar tabelası kapatılmıştır ya da kırılmıştır cumhuriyetten sonra. And after the republic um, built, and they like you can see that people covered actually on top of the inscriptions or they, they destroyed them. 20. yüzyılın başına kadar İstanbul'da böyle 600'e yakın mimari ofisi olduğundan bahsediyor. And people, the, the sources are informing us that there were like 600 or more sort of buildings. Ben like 80 farklı mimara ulaştım. But he could manage to find one, 180 of these Ve onların inscriptions. Ve onların isimleri ve dışında başka hiçbir şey bilmiyoruz. And yani aslında bireyin birey olduğunu kanıtlayan kart vizitler, kimlikler, telefon defterleri ya da hiçbir şey. So we don't have any information about those individuals apart from the inscriptions that we have right now. Bu prodüksiyona dair, aslında prodüksiyon nasıl gerçekleştiğine dair birkaç imaj da göstermek belki faydalı. I mean, this is the process of building and replicate replicates of these inscriptions. Asa bina üzerine ne vardı? Son aynen tekrarlıyorduk. So this is the exact same thing that you see on the on the building. 
Çok hızlı geçiyorum bu arada süreden dolayı ve sonuç olarak mimarlar mezarlığı doğdu. Yeah, so this is the uh, the the cemetery of architects so this exhibition. Um, Ve projeye paralel olarak bir tane kitap yaptık. Aslında ıssız kent şu demek ki amatörlüğü o. So this is the book, Triology of the Deserted City, which is connected to this project. Kısaca uh, Studio X'in sanırım Cihsep Buktan yaptığı ilk kitaptı bu. Mm -hmm. Studio X İstanbul'un. Ve üç katmanda yine aynı mahalleyi uh, inceledik. Mahallenin potansiyel ilk sahipleri, üçüncü katman, ikinci katmanda mimarlar. Ve son katmanda aslında bugünden geriye doğru gittiğimiz bir kronoloji var. Ee, binaların son sahipleri transseksüeller ve seks işçileri. Okay, so this book has is, is touching upon three layers of information that we get. The first owners of these buildings, minorities, and then um, and the tr how they are now transferred to uh, like a ghetto area where transsexuals and um, sex workers are inhabited. Um, just a second. Ve e, benim daha önce yaptığım bir arşiv projesinde e, binaların ilk sahiplerine ait olduğunu düşündüğümüzde aynı zamanda da Butterfly Collection dediğim başka bir işim olan zaten bir koleksiyon paylaştık. And the pictures from these all the inhabitants of the older in inhabitants of these buildings. Aslında aynı mahallenin üç farklı katmanı, üç farklı tarihsel yer örgütü düşünebiliriz. Yeah, so the three layers of historical uh, background. Uh, günümüzde İstanbul'da çok fazla star mimar kavramı tartışılıyor. So um, nowadays you, you can, in, in Istanbul uh, there's a concept of star architectures. Ve um, Avrupa'dan ve Amerika'dan çok fazla star mimar büyük isimler uh, ciddi paralar karşılığı gelip rezidanslar yapıyor. And like the people from Europe and US they came they come to, to Istanbul to, to build uh, really luxurious residence. Uh, places and malls and etc. Aynı zamanda mimarlar mezarlı biraz o süreci aynı tutmak ve onun ürünüsü gibi. So this, in, the, in that sense, uh, the cemetery of uh, architects is sort of creating an irony uh, that, you know, the, the Çünkü situation Çünkü İstanbul aslında have. lokal mimarlarını kaybetti. Instead, but <gülüyor> actually the uh, Istanbul lost their own uh, local architects with this process. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Typhoon. Um, I want to also, uh, I, I, I guess I saved the best for last in terms of thank yous. I, I want to thank you, Gav Gavin. Gavin sitting in the back. Gavin Browning is really responsible for all of this. He's a director of events uh, here and has, has put this whole thing together, including this uh, experimental preservation uh, if I may call this the first experimental, publica experimental preservation publication, uh, which was uh, d done also in collaboration with um, um, uh, Studio X Global Network, I believe. Uh, am I right, Gavin? Uh, Aha, uh -huh. Marina Otero put this together, which is, um, really fantastic because it's re it, it's it's sort of the, the it's it's really appropriate that it's a, a pamphlet that it would be the first the first uh, experimental preservation publication. Um, so take one because it's a collector's item. Um, um, the next speaker is Alex uh, Lenner, uh, trained as an architect and as a an urban designer with a PhD from the Eytaha in Zurich and a master's in architecture from the University uh, of California in LA. I usually, usually that's supposed to be the other way around. I read that the other way. You're supposed to have your master's first, then your PhD, but anyway. Uh, so this, um, he's now a professor at the Eytaha in, in, in Zurich, where his position is actually quite interesting because it's, it's affiliated with the Eytaha Future Cities Laboratory which has its base both in Zurich and in Singapore. So you split your time between both places. So very much, again, uh, like GSAPP, thinking, the ATH is thinking about what is a global uh, understanding uh, of uh, experimental preservation and of architecture and of our field in general um, today. 
He's a, a partner in the firm uh, Siriacides Lenner Architecten in Zurich. And mo most recently, he curated the German pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2014 with really an extraordinary uh, proposal, which I hope you will show. I'm not sure what you will show, but which, which is called uh, Bungalow uh, Germania, in which he made a replica of the uh, uh, German Chancellor's bung uh, bungalow in Bonn, designed by Sepp Ruff in 1964. So we look forward to your presentation. Please join me in welcoming Alex Lenner. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. Um, uh, for me, this meeting is quite important uh, to have a conversation with uh, peers who I expect have similar issues with uh, uh, architectural history and, and heritage. Um, as one of those architects um, uh, who spends half of his life in academia, I of course have a strong interest in, uh, in history and also preservation maybe. Uh, but I obviously would never call myself, or could never call myself, a historian. Um, my approach to history is rather the one of an amateur. Uh, so uh, recently I allowed myself to consider that as some kind of uh, quality, uh, to also produce uh, certain and specific kinds of work. As such, I like very much the, the challenge and the idea of a continuous present, or at least something borrowed from uh, English um, uh, grammar called present perfect. How do we move on? Yeah. So um, uh, one intriguing present perfect technique is of course uh, spoiling, um, meaning to loot or to steal stories and montaging them into a new present. Uh, but the other direction is equally interesting. Um, taking a new story and reinserting it into an existing past, like uh, for example Woody Allen's Zelig, you it's ridiculous to, to talk about uh, Woody Allen in New York. <laughs> but uh, it's a good example uh, of such, like Woody, uh, um, is a good, Zelig is a good example of such inverted spoil, you might call it. But the best projects, I think, combine these two directions uh, and allow for a simultaneous uh, dual legibility into both historical directions. Um, one project, um, which we didn't invent ourselves, uh, but what was important for us to document, uh, and which is lying outside in the hallway, was the project of the Western town within the Hollywood movie that does exactly that. It reinserts new stories into a very ephemeral moment of American history and urbanization, which otherwise we probably would have completely forgotten about. So um, we literally revisited, I don't know, can we uh, lower the light a little bit? Is that possible? It's important. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's, it's very dark anyhow. So we literally revisited all these places of the American West. For example, here is the mining town of La Hood of Pale Rider. One of, like, some, maybe some of you might know this movie. It's not a very important movie, but above you see the time of 1967 or respectively 1865. It's somewhere in Idaho. So this is the, the current location. Or here, the next one, the town of Lago at, uh, of High Plains Drifter, um, somewhere at Mono Lake in California. We did, of course, find nothing, as you can see. It's one of the few towns in history that completely vanished. Uh, so we found nothing, nothing except the backdrop and the ground of these towns. But nevertheless, the outcome of this uh, study produced uh, 22 very detailed plans of these towns as if they were truly existing and making them part of some kind of actual contemporary urban discourse and architectural discourse. So uh, out there are these kind of 22 plans where we spend every, every effort to depict them as best as possible. So this speculative project was kind of the blueprint, uh, what was already told, for our project of the curation of the German Pavilion at this year's Venice Architecture Biennale. The task, you might know, uh, was to look at architectural, uh, architecture's uh, modern past through the lens of national history. As we are neither historians nor curators, we needed to find some kind of architectural moment 
uh, where these two stories, the architecture, uh, past, and the national history, could somehow meet. We found that moment in an architectural montage of two buildings, two buildings highly charged with political and cultural meaning. One is the German pavilion, you might know from the Biennale on the right, um, and the Giardini that was extensively remodeled by the Nazi regime in 1938. And ever since after the war is subject to a large discussion in Germany whether this building could actually still represent Germany at any kind of Biennale. Um, it is a building that almost only is entrance. The other one is quite different, but equally charged with meaning and ambition. It is the official house of the German Chancellor, built in 1964 in Bonn. Uh, Bonn is Germany's temporary post-war capital, you might know. It was the place where the Chancellor had to live and represent. So, in a way, this building, as you can see here, is, so to speak, Germany's modern and maybe moderate version of uh, your White House, uh, Downing Street in London, or the LSE uh, Palace in, in Paris. It's some kind of, uh, yeah, Craig Elwoodish uh, bungalow. It has everything a bungalow needs. It has a patio, it has a nice chimney, a canopy. It's located in the park in Bonn. In the back, you see the River Rhine. So basically, this building cannot be seen from the outside. Everything which ha what happened in this building happened, it was only transmitted and tr uh, transferred to the public through media, through, the, through pictures and television. Um, so, um, but nothing really makes this, uh, the similarities between the two buildings, even though they are quite dif difficult, uh, different, two buildings more clear than what their clients said about them. The first is the second chancellor of the new Federal Republic of Germany, Ludwig Erhard, um, saying about his bungalow in Bonn, you will find out more about me if you look at this house than if you watch me deliver a political speech. The letter down below is uh, Germany's well-known last dictator saying about, uh, his, about this building something like, um, um, like the following, which is not too different, different to what was said by Ludwig Erhard which means when buildings are experiencing great times internally, they, find, they also find external images for these, it, for these times. Their word is persuasive, is more persuasive than any spoken word, for it is a word made of stone. So first and foremost, these two buildings were nothing else than means of political communication. So if we assume buildings can speak, the experiment was of course, to let these two buildings speak with one another, and we are basically merely the audience and witnesses of this conversation. So therefore, the bungalow had to travel from Bonn to Venice to get almost unbearably close to the pavilion. At first, we thought um, they wouldn't get along at all. And in fact, some quite unfair and even nasty violations happened. For example, suddenly, the bungalow gets on a podium, something that a true bungalow never, really never wanted to do. Or it gets viciously directed through the giant portico of the pavilion. On the other hand, the longitudinal plan of the, of the central space of the pavilion gets brutally centered by the bungalow's patio. So here, here you can see the plan of the whole experiment. You see on the right, you see the, the patio in the, in, in the center, and the chimney, and in the section, you see the one-to-one -one, um, implant of the bungalow's roof into the much higher, much taller building, uh, central, uh, centrally built space of um, the pavilion. But you also see in this experiment that, uh, and which was really astounding, is that uh, how sometimes harmoniously the two buildings complement each other. The bungalow, the bungalow roof, for example, uh, respectfully stops like right 30 centimeters before the pavilion wall. So in this whole uh, drama, the question of material uh, was one of the most difficult ones. If a building can talk, so must its material. Is something like the bungalow's brick able to carry meaning beyond its immediate presence 
and transport the stories it witnesses, with all these kind of political gestures happening uh, in front of it. The question gets evident uh, when the material becomes totally dysfunctional in Venice, yet re-aggregates into a quasi-functional whole, uh, like the chimney inside the pavilion. At a very silly moment, uh, we fired up that chimney to almost contradict its dysfunctional yet very physical reality in the pavilion. In, in, in Venice, the main question of meaning and material, in fact, only gets urgency since both pavilion and bungalow lose their original functionality. For example, the glass of the bungalow doesn't provide any views to the outside anymore or is considered any kind of thermal barrier anymore. On the contrary, the glass becomes an object in space itself and as such subject to, dif to, to different, very different kinds of interpretation. And certainly, the whole pavilion as an object turns from a piece of exhibition architecture to exhibiting, uh, to exhibiting itself as architecture as well, just like the bungalow does. And what is important in these pictures is that there's no real winner between uh, the two buildings and the tail between the two buildings. There's no hierarchy, but in best case, some kind of dual legibility allows for a third space to emerge between them. But still, as you can see here, um, the doors too tall for the bungalow roof cut into the roof every morning the pavilion opens its doors. And a whole kind of reorganization of the two buildings happens with blind hallways and a lot of strange material overlays. With a non-accessible kitchen in the back, a way to, loo to low apps, and a cut sofa in half, which didn't want to move its location. The material in this, uh, in this bungalow in Venice is brand new. So uh, we always joke about if you, we are kind of in the year 64, and if you want to see how that looks in 50 years, you have to go back to Bonn to go to the original bungalow, which now turned, unfortunately, kind of turned into a museum and is no longer um, of any public use. The only, true, the only true artifact is Helmut Kohl's last five-ton armored limousine from 1991, uh, which builds the exterior scene as it serves both buildings, the bungalow and the pavilion. And it is, I think, a very typical scene of national representation and architecture of these days. And the best thing, I think, is that um, in no less than two months, this whole exhibition will be history itself, as it will be gone completely again. Thank you very much. Um, can we get, uh, as a memento, part of the building? Can, can we order? They're not just going to throw it in the lagoon. Okay. Really? We'll take it. Um, extraordinary. Um, our next speaker is Azra Camilla. Uh, she is an artist uh, trained as an architect at Graz in Princeton and as an architectural historian at MIT where she received her PhD. She is uh, the class of 1922 career development professor and assistant professor of the arts at MIT's Art, Culture, and Technology program. Um, her work probes into this question of polit the politics of identity and memory uh, by looking at the body, at the scale of the body, at, the, at clothes, at wearable at, at, at what we used to call clothes and now is called wearable technology. Um, uh, she looks at the relation between that and civic scale <laughs> in architecture. She looks at the relationship between dressing and, and building. 
uh, and building culture and cultural institutions. So how our own clothes represent our culture and how our cultural institutions represent us. So it's very involved questions of representation, of meaning and identity, but also interested in how these intersect with questions of history and globality and global flows. Uh, and so she's been working on a series of, of projects that think of heritage as not something that you inherit, but something that you sort of launch into the future. And so she calls these future heritage uh, projects. Uh, in particular, she's interested in the way that Islam is represented in the West, uh, coming at it from uh, uh, experiences of nationalism in the Balkans since the 1990s. And she's very interested in the way that cultural institutions of heritage play a role in shaping these, uh, these perceptions and in constructing notions of the common good, of ethical behavior, uh, and of, of um, restoring the peace in divided societies. Her work has been exhibited uh, in a number of very prominent uh, international exhibitions from the Liverpool Biennial to Manifesta, uh, and I'm sort of jumping around a very long uh, uh, a, a CV over here to a closer to home here for us, the Queen's Museum of Art and the Fondazione Giorgio Cini as part of the 54th Art Biennale in Venice. Please join me in welcoming Azra Escamilla. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, being here and for inviting me to um, be part of this wonderful event. It's a great honor. Not here. So today uh, I would like to talk about um, a series of projects that are concerned with the future of heritage and maybe future of experimental preservation. Um, and also address the question of you know, what is the creative content um, that we experiment with in relation to um, relevance, to, to its politics, um, and also the notion of agency, to what, um, to what uh, means are we actually experimenting and what can we do with this form of experimentation. Okay. How do I shift? You just hit the space button. Ah, okay. So let me start with a little story from uh, the city where I come from, from Sarajevo. It was uh, October 4th, 19, uh, uh, 2012. Uh, dozens of protesters, students, museologists, people from Sarajevo are standing in front of the building of the National Museum in Sarajevo and witnessing what was to become a historical event the doors of the National Museums are about to be closed and nailed with wooden planks as if expecting a tornado. The closure of the museum happens for the first time uh, in the 125 years of the history of the museum. So the museum survived the recent uh, war of the 1990s and um, also you know, previously the second and first world war destruction, it is full of artifacts, precious um, elements of, of history of the region, but it has now become inaccessible to public. This is not the only institution that is in acute crisis. There are seven other state level institutions in that country that are about to be shut down or have already been shut down. So this was the start of my work um, in Bosnia where I, you know, witnessed this acute crisis of, of culture and heritage and, and was faced with a question that is really very unique where you have, um, you have institutions, you have heritage, uh, but you cannot access them. They're not you know, legally defined. No one can do anything with them. So uh, really think about this. Like, what if you cannot go into your museum? What if we wouldn't have these institutions? Um, so, in that respect, I would like to make um, uh, three points that I think could inform our discussion about um, uh, experimental preservation and also uh, what is it that we can you know, do with it to what end. So the first point is that 
cultural heritage has agency and, and um, in the sense that it is a witness of history, it is an embodiment in case in, of Bosnia and Herzegovina of a long history of coexistence. Um, for centuries, churches, mosques, synagogues stood side by side, uh, meaning also that you know, the people who worshiped in them managed to live uh, peacefully as neighbors. And this history was under attack in the early 1990s when um, the former Yugoslavia was falling apart, um, different ethnic nationalism uh, rose and uh, different factions, I will not go into details here, um, you know, were claiming to power and they were doing this by attacking um, cultural heritage. So one poignant moment in that history was the uh, purposeful demolition of the um, uh, famous Ottoman bridge in Mostar that was really the symbol of that coexistence. And, um, but only not, uh, not only that uh, you know, bridge, but also other artifacts and uh, um, institutions of culture were systematically targeted. So the ethnic cleansing in Yugoslavia um, and in Bosnia in particular was uh, carried out in a twofold strategy. On the one hand, people were exterminated through concentration camps, through you know, mass expulsion and mass murder. On the other hand, uh, there was a systematic destruction of their material and um, historical traces. So libraries, museums, uh, cemeteries, um, monuments of, and, and religious buildings were destroyed uh, one after another and this was the burning of the National Library in, in Sarajevo uh, in, in the early 90s. Religious buildings were particularly targeted because they were the most important and most uh, kind of poignant symbols of um, different ethnic groups identity in public space. So, you know, in the case of Islamic religious architecture, for example, that I studied, 70% uh, of Islamic religious heritage was completely or heavily destroyed. And the idea here on the part of those who were destroying them was to not only you know, erase um, the, the evidence that this and this ethnic group was living in a certain territory, but also the way in which um, heritage was destroyed with a sort of sadism on architecture, for example, you know, imams being crucified on doors of the buildings or community being shot in front of religious sites and then kind of buried with the stones of the buildings meant that you know you would traumatize the population to that extent and merge it with this, their cultural symbols so that you forever extinguish their, um, their desire for coexistence. When the war ended in 1995 with the Dayton Peace Agreement, you know, the fighting was, so to say, stopped from the top but the war perpetuated itself in, with different means in form of cultural warfare, uh, instrumentalization of language and cultural heritage and architecture in this case. All over the Bosnia you have uh, these exaggerated um, religious buildings that are kind of competing for visibility and demarcation of territories and kind of claiming land and also witnessing that maybe people also have survived and, and are back to their certain territories. So in this case, agency of a heritage could be, um, you know, it depends in whose hands it is, either uh, you can reframe and recreate national narratives, uh, but also you could maybe reinsert the evidence of your existence and coexistence, which many also do in Bosnia, that are saying, okay, you wanted to get us out of this land, we are back and we actually want to live together. So um, now from this context, um, in cultural institutions in Bosnia have also fell victim to this you know, continued cultural warfare. And uh, because you have now, you know, nationalist uh, extremists are still on power and they are claiming basically that, you know, people cannot live together anymore and saying, well, we don't have a common state, we, we don't have a common history, we don't want to live with you guys anymore. Which then means that you cannot support common state-level institutions. 
And the result of that kind of political turmoil is that you have these major um, existing buildings from the previous regime with all the stuff in them that uh, have no legal status and have a um, completely insecure future. So they have been vegetating for the last 20 years since the end of the war uh, due to you know, voluntary work of the people working in them. And so uh, you know, reacting to this crisis, I um, co-founded with colleagues, uh, museologists, historians, artists, and cultural activists from both the region and also uh, international, this platform called Culture Shutdown. And it's this interdisciplinary platform that is um, you know, really focused on investigating this problem and looking how we can actually intervene in um, uh, this institutional conversation and crisis to also uh, talk about the state and the kind of future of coexistence in, in that er area. Uh, so we do different types of actions. Some of it was you know, to do a research about what has happened and what are the reasons of the crisis. They're not just budgetary. But the other is to say, OK, we can maybe raise awareness about the, the problem. So last year, I started this um, campaign called Solidarity Day, calling out museums and libraries worldwide and galleries to cross out one artifact in their collection in reference to the um, barricaded door of the National Museum in Sarajevo with this yellow barricade tape that I would send them. They could sign up on our website, give me the address, I send them the tape. And then very soon, uh, pictures started coming. The action actually went viral and uh, went global. So it was from huge institutions like the German Historical Museum to uh, smaller, a lot of Jewish museums participated, or Holocaust museums, and also little museums, you know, regional museums of natural history. And it was really fantastic to see this, you know, vast range of what all is heritage and, and what if we wouldn't have that and that thing. Um, so over 300 institutions participated, which was really incredible and also prompted me to ask myself, you know, why would someone now in Australia or in Japan care about some museum and some heritage in Bosnia? And it seems that, you know, like even the institutions, for example, from the neighboring um, uh, Serbia or also uh, Austria uh, were participating, which kind of was signal and giving political signals to the equivalent ethnic groups in Bosnia saying, well, actually, you know, Serbs in Serbia are also caring about heritage in, you know, in Bosnia too. And they have actually similar problems uh, with their own nationalists and also with, with their own museums. So um, this then prompted a discussion about, uh, you know, can we actually use this kind of action to start uh, a discussion about can this heritage and this institution lead us to a, uh, indirectly to a discussion about the state? What is the future of the state? On the one hand, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, because this is, you know, these institutions are symbols of the state. But on the other hand, you know, what is the future of the national museum in a post-national society and a kind of, in a, a global society? So the action that was so global and viral also brought in this other layer that I started expanding in my uh, other work um, of this bigger crisis of the museum. Uh, museums losing relevance, particularly the National Museum or the National Gallery, um, in the times of globalizations and where you know, people have global claims to heritage. Uh, so the question is then, whose heritage are we talking about? and you know, who is, so to say, uh, meant to preserve them if we are thinking about these uh, objects in both a kind of local and, and global terms. And the third point I would like to make is that the objects themselves have agency in the sense that they can um, help us um, uh, like look at the actual meaning and they can tell stories. They can help us reinstall and, and reframe stories. Uh, so I would like to introduce this project called Future Heritage Collection that is a collection of objects and stories about objects that are, um, um, so to say, like b both personal and also shared with others. 
um, because notions of heritage are always something that needs to be negotiated. You know, to, to claim something to be heritage cannot have just your personal meaning. You have to find a shared meaning with other people. So this is what I'm doing currently in Bosnia, is to invite people to come to the Future Heritage Collection office. Uh, this is an exhibition currently running in a gallery in Sarajevo and bring artifacts that they consider important to be included into future heritage collection. They're invited to become curators of their own heritage. Um, and what they do is they bring objects, they tag them, they fill out this little card. The card is inspired by the uh, UN symbol of pro protection for uh, cultural heritage in the time of conflict. Um, and they write up a little story about the meaning of this object. Why is that something that should be shared and considered as a kind of shared good uh, in, in Bosnia? So objects that were brought is quite interesting. This was, for example, a map original from um, 1876, I think, from Austro-Hungarian period. Uh, Austro-Hungary started investigating Bosnia before they then colonized and then annexed it. Uh, so and it, what's very relevant for the discussion of citizenship in Bosnia today is that this map actually has uh, city names from the pre-war period. A lot of the city names have changed now and they have been, so to say, uh, tagged with national labels. But also artifacts like Vučko, this is a little wolf that was the symbol of the Olympic uh, Games in 84 that were held in Sarajevo that you know, really stood also for the kind of peak of that coexistence and, and development uh, of the region and that people would like to remember. And so you know, to big, zoom this out of Bosnia to bigger questions of you know, who cares about heritage and, and um, what are the kinds of questions we should be thinking about. I have this um, collection takes place in different forms. So there are exhibitions like this where it's really about people participating, discuss, discussing, and proposing objects. But then also there is this, uh, say, mail from the future where I, I have a video that I'll show you a little excerpt from where I stage myself as an archaeologist coming from the future. And in that future, there are different scenarios. So sometimes there is no heritage at all. Or second time, you know, no one cares. Um, and, you know, I ask that people in the present to think about different um, issues that are happening right now that are threatening maybe heritage in the future. So could we play the video uh, from the point two, I think. So there are ten of these scenarios. I'll just show you two or three. And they are narrating these postcards with mail from the future. And there should be some sound. Dear citizen of the world, the United Nations General Assembly is planning to revise the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the next five years. The goal is to promote appreciation of cultural heritage and the human rights for all cultural groups in your country and ensure access to such culture by all. Can you help identify one example of cultural heritage in your country that is not accessible to all groups? And please explain why it is so. Please help them with your insight and personal experience. Thank you. And then let's skip to the five. A lot of costumes here. I had a lot of fun, you know, like buying Thank all this you. stuff. Thank you. Dear citizen of the world, I'm writing to you from the future in which all memory and history of the world has been digitized. With our technology, we are unable to unlock the data that has been digitally preserved in your time. Envision a massive, indestructible archive and construction that preserves global memory for the very distant future. 
can help me collect the artifacts from this archive that will remain relevant for a thousand years from your time. What would you choose and why? Thank you. Back to the slides, please. I just want to end with Cecilia, because she's such a wonderful <laughs> experimental preservationist. Um, let's have an image of, of her masterpiece. I was just showing, so all of these PC, uh, scenarios in the video are actually inspired by the actual, um, by the actual events. Can we have the PowerPoint? Next. Okay. Ta so, I don't know, when I first encountered this, I was really, uh, I was just amazed by uh, what, what happened here. <laughs> but also really sad about the way this poor woman was portrayed in the media. You know, everyone was laughing about her and she became a meme and uh, there was really like a lot of uh, kind of fun about it. But I think it's a very powerful kind of transformation that is happening here and she can teach us a lot about, uh, you know, uh, at least for our discussion, who is the expert, who is allowed to uh, preserve and experiment. And um, I think she definitely has to be part of the, the panel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So now, that's great. Uh, part, of, part of what we've been doing in each of the uh, experimental preservation roundtables that we've been organizing is thinking about who's the, who should we be including in the next one, so now we know. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that very provocative and, and, and uh, um, extraordinary presentation. Our last speaker uh, for the evening before our discussion is David Gisson. Uh, trained as a historian and theorist of architecture and, uh, um, uh, at the University of Virginia, Columbia University, Yale, uh, receiving his PhD from the University College London. Uh, he is currently Associate Professor of Architecture and Visual Studies at the California College of Arts. Um, his work focuses on uh, an experimental form of practice in architectural history. That's the sort of origin of his, uh, uh, of his uh, path. And he's been thinking very much about architectural history as a mode of expression that is not reducible to writing and that incorporates an aesthetic dimension. And we know a little bit about some precedents to that when we think about uh, Heinrich Wolflin and the introduction of the double lanterns uh, into the lecturing about art history and that going all the way to Gideon and Christian Norbrook Schultz and others who then make it into books. 
Um, but really, not enough work has been done about the role of architectural historians, not only in producing a type of aesthetic, but actually in shaping the taste of not just architects, but of culture in general about uh, architecture. Uh, and shaping what we pay attention to and what we don't pay attention to. I always recall sort of going to, um, uh, to Tivoli and trying to find the sketch that in the photograph that such, you know, such and such architectural historian, you know, so you really look to recreate these moments and these aesthetics. So he's been pushing on this idea very much and actually uh, begun to uh, move to the other side into a practice that incorporates reenactments, recreations, fabulations about what monuments are, what cultural heritage is, um, that engages the archive uh, critically and also foregrounds the creativity of engaging with, with history. His curatorial and experimental preservation practice has been exhibited at a number of different places, currently at the Canadian Center for Architecture, which I believe he, he will show since that's up on the, on the screen, but also here in New York at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, the National Building Museum, uh, Yale Architecture Gallery, and a long list of other, of other places. So we're very fortunate to have David here tonight. Please help, uh, join me in welcoming him. Thanks for that fantastic introduction. And um, I too feel very honored to be here with this panel and, and feeling very inspired sitting there writing notes and, and making doodles as well of potential projects that can emerge from this discussion. So in 2012, I wrote a petition addressed to the Department of History and Heritage of the City of Paris that called for the reconstruction of a large mound of earth and hay made in 1871 in Paris's Place Vendôme by the urban revolution known as the Paris Commune. And you're looking at an image of a blog that I used to maintain about this, this issue of, of experimenting with history where I first uh, presented the petition. And on the right is an image of a model that was included in the exhibition that Jorge mentioned about the project at the Canadian Center for Architecture, which actually um, just closed uh, two weeks ago. So the original mound, which you see here, was constructed in May 1871 by the Commune and was used in the Commune's spectacular demolition of the Place Vendôme column. The mound acted as a, uh, as a type of cushion as the Commune pulled the column uh, down into it. So I don't have an enormous amount of time to get into the specific politics of the Commune. We could be here all night. But among their numerous progressive political goals, they wished to actually transform the urban iconography of Paris. And one of the items on their agenda was the destruction of this monumental column. The original Vendome column, here, here you're looking at it um, being prepared for its demolition. The original Vendome column was commissioned by Napoleon and completed in 1810, and it celebrated his military victories over Euro other European nations. And it was actually based upon Trajan's uh, original imperial column in Rome. Napoleon actually wanted to move Trajan's column to the Place Vendome and, and take it apart and re-erect it piece by piece here but his advisor said it, would it was both politically and financially prohibitive to do that. So they commissioned architects to essentially reconstruct the, um, the, the sense of the, of the Trajan's column. But now, instead of showing uh, images of Trajan defeating the Dacians, here it shows images of Napoleon uh, defeating the Austrian Empire. And as the original Trajan's column was crowned with, an with a representation of Trajan as emperor, Napoleon had a monument commissioned of him as emperor over, over, over the French uh, empire and, and, and drawn in, an, uh, rendered, sorry, in imperial clothing, imperial dress. So after Napoleon's final exile, the statue of him as emperor was removed from the top of the Vendome column and a statue of Napoleon as citizen was put back up here. But when Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon III, Napoleon III came to power several decades later, he actually recommissioned the reconstructed this, the original statue and had a place back on its top as a kind of symbol of the new Bonapartist regime. And it's at this time that the, the, the column becomes a very hated symbol among the French left, who did not use this word at the time, but described it as, as the way today we might describe fascist imagery or, or fascist symbolism. So shortly after seizing power, 
in the aftermath of Napoleon III's defeat, the commune issued this decree. Considering that the imperial column in the Place Vendôme is a monument to barbarism, a symbol of brute force and glory, an affirmation of militarism, a negation of international law, a permanent insult to the vanquished by the victors, a perpetual assault on one of the three great principles of the French Republic fraternity. It is hereby decreed. The column at the Place Vendôme will be destroyed. It's kind of an extraordinary indictment of an object in urban space. And when you read the entire decree, one of the things that it stipulates quite carefully, quite clearly, is that it's the column that will be demolished and that the surrounding architecture should not be harmed in this large symbolic act in this large um, symbolic demolition. And so they were very concerned that bringing down something that's essentially the size of a sequoia tree and made of bronze and marble in the center of Paris would damage the surrounding architecture. It would cave in the street. There's actually a very large sewer built by Osman under the Rue de la Paix, which um, runs under the Place Vendôme, and they're worried the entire street would cave in. So they made this mound as a way to offer some protection as they would, in, sen in a sense, fell the column. So the mound was made from dirt and, and, and what are called stable scraping. So it's essentially hay, manure, and dirt. Okay, it's just what was sort of there within the imperial ecology of France. From the, a lot of the uh, material actually came from the slaughterhouses of La Valette. A lot of the dirt in there came from excavations, from buildings that were under construction. So it's very much a reappropriation of a kind of imperial um, ec um, ecology uh, from the time. It was also, in a sense, a symbolic insult because this thing, this object and monument that celebrated the Bonapartist regime would essentially fall into a pile of manure and hay. So as I learned as I was working on the research for this project from an extraordinary landscape historian named Alessandro Ponte, the mound at the Place Vendôme also invoked other earlier mounds built by the original French Revolution and upon which revolutionary symbols were erected. This is an image of the Festival of the Supreme Being from the late 18th century in which Robespierre commissioned uh, the artist David to build an enormous mound um, immediately outside the walls of Paris and upon which were erected um, symbols of uh, revolutionary France and a kind of festival was, was um, cast around this thing. And of course the commune inverts the idea of this by not using the mound as a place to erect symbols by which to make symbols fall and be destroyed. So on May 16th, 1871, in front of a large crowd, a large group of workers turned this capstan, which you see right here, this, this kind of pulley, um, with ropes connected to the column and pulled the column down into the mound. A celebration erupted on the bronze and marble debris left from the destroyed column. You can see the statue of the Napoleon to the right. It actually missed the mound by about three feet and cracked in two as it hit the ground, so it was essentially destroyed. And the songs were sung, speeches were made. Um, the commune renamed the Place Vendôme Place Internationale, and the empty base that you see, which once held the column, was now called the altar to peace. And the celebration was actually very short-lived because the commune would be brutally suppressed by the national government just days later. They were besieging Paris, trying to take it back from these socialistic rebels. And a very brutal repression of, uh, of the communards and people associated with them followed. But the representations of this destruction really um, circulated in drawing form throughout um, throughout the Western world, in newspapers, in photographic albums, such as the one that this photo um, came from, <clears throat> and also has been reproduced many, many times. For example, the Situationist International in the 60s um, republished this image um, from the immediate aftermath of the commune and called the destruction of the Vendome Column the greatest artistic act of the 19th century. So immediately after the fall of the commune and when the national government secured the city, uh, the new government of Monsieur Thiers uh, immediately commissioned engineers and architects to collect the column fragments, to repair them, and to re-erect them exactly as they were before. This is a, a photo of the Mandoui factory where the pieces were repaired. This is where the Statue of Liberty was built, for example. This is a, a very important place in, um, in metalwork in France. So this, the, the kind of reconstruction, I guess this is the second reconstruction, Trajan, now, uh, uh, now after being destroyed, um, reconstructed again. In this way, this, this second construction of the Place Vendôme column can also be looked at as the first monument to the destruction of the commune, although that history is completely lost to those who come to the Place today. From then until now, all trace of these events are absent from the square. So in choosing a petition that called for the mound's 
Reconstruction, I wanted an entryway into this history that suggested how historical, how historical Reconstruction could operate as, as, as both action, okay, and also as public agitation. In a sense, I wanted to rekindle the provocative relationship between document and artifact that one might sense in the original decree. Also, for me, as someone who, who does so much work on urban landscapes and urban nature, there was something about the mound that, in a sense, related to things that I was very familiar with, this, this idea of the subnatural and the kind of peripheral and marginal forms of nature that are built in cities, but also something um, that suggested other possibilities for how we might look at landscapes and cities as, as, as, very, as literally politicized artifacts, not ones that we could read political histories into them, but ones that were, in a sense, built as forms of protest, as forms of action. So my interest in the mound also relates to a series of other concerns that were uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, contemporary events that were happening at the time that I um, was writing the petition. So for example, the various pro protests of 2011 in Northern Africa, in Europe, and specifically in the United States, often had co imagery that reminded me of imagery from the commune or explicitly had imagery from the commune. These are images from the Occupy Oakland movement in which very explicit references are being made to reenact ideas from the commune. You can see a, a pile of hay if you look closely in the, uh, in the, upper, um, the, the upper part of the photograph on the right. And actually, I believe there was an artist in New York named Zoe Beloff who actually hired people to reenact scenes from the commune down at Occupy Wall Street here. So this is something that was very, that was very much um, happening at the time. And in terms of theories of historical preservation and historical reconstruction, I'm becoming increasingly interested in how actions relate to processes of urban destruction and reconstruction. In a variety of protests, we see people protesting the destruction of artifacts and also destroying icons themselves, right, as you see in these photos. But it's often more difficult to imagine people picketing for the reconstruction of a monument or a monumental reconstruction emerging out of an urban protest. You can't sort of, you can't instantly reconstruct a stone cathedral in a protest. It sounds, it sounds insane, right? Or it sounds very improbable. Maybe you could have a large 3D printer at a protest. But you can, however, recreate certain types of landscapes, one similar to the Mound of Vendome, and, and there are many other possibilities as well. In the beginning of January 2014, while I was actually in Paris for a series of meetings about our project, a very feisty political agitator named Terry Bourne dumped a large mound of hay and manure in front of the National Assembly of Paris. And the truck that you see on the left says, Hollande and the entire political class out. It was inspiring to me because Terry made something in five minutes that we've now been planning for two years. And so it's a pretty kind of extraordinary thing. Anyway, so this um, other image shows our attempt to see what could be made by dumping something about the same size as the mound of Vendome out the back of a truck. It's lacking a little bit of form, but if one decides to go that route, this is very much what it would look like. So the recent exhibition of the Mound of Vendome at the Canadian Center offered other moments to consider the meaning of all this. More specifically, we use this particular context to illustrate how reconstruction as a type of action can suggest alternative ways you might engage with archival materials. The Canadian Center has a really extraordinary collection of artifacts related to both the construction, the original construction, destruction, and reconstruction of the column at the Place Vendôme. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary shape compared to um, collections at other museums. Um, almost all the original photos I showed you earlier are actually from their collections. So when the Canadian Center approached me initially about exhibiting the Mound project, I was excited to make the Center's archive a, a critical part of the experience of the project in this particular context. You walk into this room and you see all these urban documents that portray the events in the Place Vendôme before, during, and immediately after the commune. The only, only explanatory text that you find in the gallery is the original decree of 1871, which I read to you and you see on the left, and then our petition, which has essentially been blown up on the wall and describes the, um, the potential project. So history in this context is presented to you in a way that I think is quite different than a kind of sequential narration of events that you might more typically find with certain types of history exhibitions. So in the periphery surrounding the archival materials are a series of contemporary reconstructions that join the petition and are meant to show, show both the ease with which the mound can be made, but also sort of play with your, your sense of things in a sense you don't know if the images are in a sense colorized black and white photographs of the original mound, removed all the people, removed all the store signs, all the satellite dishes, any sense of historicism. Um, 
And then we, and also the, the proposal for the model pre proposal is also um, ex exceedingly abstracted. So um, can we show the video of, that we have here? So uh, this man, who's, who's also a budding experimental historian, like our painter <laughs> of the potato Jesus, um, came to the exhibition and was inspired to sort of create the fourth reenactment of the destruction of the Vendome column. I apologize for this. They captured it on, um, there's no sound, they captured it on the security cameras and they were telling me how horrible this all was, but it was also kind of funny. And I, and I said to them, you should totally post this online. It's like amazing. Like this sitting there, he's reading these things, he's walking around, looking at the archival materials. I don't know if this is a visiting scholar at the CCA, maybe you, some of you know this person. Anyway, so he walks around and very lovingly looks at his creation and leaves. <laughs> right. So he's now an assistant professor at the California College of the Arts. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Is this working now? I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do that, but um, so th that's that's terrific. So we will follow up with uh, with about half an hour of discussion because um, I, I I'm sure stomachs are growling and we all want to eat at some point. Um, uh, Tortus Arrhenius uh, will will respond first and sort of launch our discussion. And Eric is going to join us in a second. He had to step out, and we'll uh, uh, do that. But I will introduce them both, and maybe you can uh, uh, sort of speak first, and then he can join. But Tortus Arrhenius is an architect, trained as an architect, professor in architectural history and conservation at the Oslo School of Architecture, where she has really transform the uh, preservation program there. Um, she is a, a founding member of the Oslo Center for Critical Architectural Studies and a leader of the four-year international research project Place and Displacement, Exhibiting Architecture, which is now uh, a publication which I recommend to all of you. She is also the author of an extraordinary book called The Fragile Monument, which takes uh, on questions of preservation um, across the 19th century and 20th century and explores this question of the monument as we typically think of monuments as something really solid, very hard to destroy, but in fact she looks at the way in which preservationists actually theorize the monument as something extraordinarily fragile that needs a lot of care and how that played its, played, uh, made its way into various, um, uh, into, into various theories of preservation and of architecture. Um, Eric uh, Langdalen is the director of the um, Institute for uh, the History and Theory and Form uh, of, uh, within the uh, School, of Architect uh, School of Architecture in Oslo. Uh, he is trained as an architect at the Oslo School of Architecture, and also here. So we welcome an alumni back to Columbia. Um, he has his own practice, uh, Langdalen Architecture, and has worked on a number of collaborations with other architects, too, uh, in particular with Stephen Hall on the Nuke Hampson Center, which was completed in 2009. So um, you have the table. 
Uh, please. Should I talk? Well, I think Tortoise was going to speak first, and maybe. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. We, we decided that when you were out. <laughs> so that's what happens. <laughs> as soon as you leave. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for fantastic presentations. Uh, and I want to bring up uh, certain kind of issues in this. Uh, one thing I think is in all the presentations is in some way the issue about authorship, uh, who is at the kind of core of preservation, authorship and originality. And that's the kind of, uh, we can say that, that preservation is obsessed by authorship and uh, originality. And in some way, all your uh, projects kind of challenge uh, issues about authorship with the idea about the possibility of replicas, of uh, reconstructions, of re retaking something, which is in my challenging uh, the whole idea about originality and authorship. And I think that was very, uh, I, I'd like in some way to start asking Tafun uh, in relationship to that, uh, your very, very beautiful kind of, I think, installation with the names mm -hmm. being, you know, as you have re, more or less reenacted that kind of uh, plaquettes on the houses that I think at first is very interesting that they put the names on the on the houses or on the kind of constructions because that in some way also spells into this whole idea about authorship. The need of putting your name up on the building, you know, this is signed by an architect. And then how you in some way reenact that by your uh, installation. And and it should be very just very, very interesting to hear a bit more about the what you thought that it, that kind of installation should make in some way. Or how it's in some way changed history. Yani, uh, aslında bizim Türkiye'de üzerinde durduğumuz bir kavram var. Bir süredir. So there's a concept that we, we, we are talking about it in Turkey uh, these days. Uh, buna kısaca aslında ötekinin kültürel mirası diyoruz. Uh, we, we talk we name it as the uh, the cultural heritage of the other. Bir süredir aslında Suriye'de ve Irak'ta sistemli olarak bazı binalar bombalamayı izliyoruz. And we watch that the system systemic bombing of some buildings in Syria and Iraq these days. Yüz sene önce Birinci Dünya Savaşı'nın Anadolu'da benzer şeyler oldu. And we can like think about a similar sort of um, a systemic destruction in the First World War in Istanbul. In the same way. In Bosnia also. Uh, uh, so there's, in reality, there's no cultural heritage. The de, de devletlerin mirası var, yani sistemlerin siyasi miraslar var. And we can talk about political heritage. Instead. Eğer sizin siyasi mirasınız dışındaysa, onun bir replikası da söz konusu. Yani eğer sizin siyasi mirasınızın siyasi kontekstinizin dışında görünüyorsa. Uh, onu yıkmak, onun tekrar bir replikasına başvurmak, onun içerisinde shopping mall yapmak söz konusu. Uh, if the government is not, <coughs> the political system is not in favor of it, then it will destroy it and then build malls and um, other types of architectural. Uh, o binalardan çok daha yeni binaların bir çoğuna Türkiye'de kimse dokunamaz. Kültürel miras olduğu için. <coughs> Ama lokal kültürel miras olduğu için. Mesela birinci yenilerin binası. So some, some of those like uh, the first national architecture movement b uh, buildings, they can't they can't touch it because it's cultural heritage, but still it was governmental. Uh, like they, it was a political, um, it was a result of a political heritage. Ama Osmanlı'nın son dönemi için şimdi yani Osmanlı'nın son dönem batılılaşma mirasını gördüğümüz bölgede şimdi shopping mall'lara girmeye hazırlanıyoruz. But the in, in, a, in a, but the the the the, the, the, the architecture the, the the buildings that we looked at today but the, they were coming from the late uh, late era, era of Ottoman Empire they are being destroyed. Uh, evet. they are their cultural heritage but yet they were not attached to a governmental or the political um, heritage at that time. Therefore they are now open to destruction. Ve proje kendini şöyle savunuyor. Onların size aynısını yapacağız. Üzülmeyin. And you know the the response from the government uh, is right now is like we will build the same things. Don't worry about it. 
Halbuki binası doku çok sağlam ve yıkamıyorlar. Yani aslında çok sağlam yapılar bu. But you know, but the fact is that the buildings that they're destroying are really strong. They're not. They don't need to be destroyed. Burada bizim için mimari yapının kimliği devreye giriyor. So yani the, mimarinin kimliği aslında. So then here we see the identity of the uh, architecture. Ve bu da, uh, yeah. No, I think it's also if we pull that a bit longer, I think one could more or less make a definition of press, uh, of heritage as the thing who gets hmm. destroyed. I mean, destruction and then it become heritage in some way. Hmm. Uh, one could kind of you know turn around Pevsner's kind of idea about what is architecture. Architecture hmm. is not the bicycle shed, he said. Is you know, that, but we can also say architecture is the object that gets destroyed, and then for kind of. Uh, Elevated into becoming a, a, a monument or a heritage, and, and, and with that kind of pushing that a little bit longer, uh, the tragic is always the things destroyed, and then someone comes in and save it. And I think I see your project a little bit like a saving project that you save the names, you you know collect them, but they should not have been collected if the buildings were not destroyed. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, I want to turn to your kind of thing because it's also your work is very very strong between the. You know, the, uh, the relationship between destruction and preservation mm. is so kind of mm. uh, close together in some way. And uh, it's this again, you know, without I think it's fantastic with the move that in some way the the the monument should be destroyed, but the you know it's also preservation of the area around it. You know, the, with the soft for one that didn't realize it. Yeah, I, yeah, but, uh, yeah. I actually really want to answer your the yeah. first question that you posed about authorship because. <laughs> I really want to answer the first question that you posed about authorship because I'm um, watching the presentations and thinking also about your work and many of the things that, that Jorge has written in Future Anterior. I, I, um, I, this is very much on my mind. And I, I think for those of us who were educated in architecture at a certain era, we were always presented with this notion that experimentalism was about this idea of the death of the author, the kind of sense of process, iteration, et cetera, when it's talking about architecture. And what I find so fascinating with this experimental preservation work is, is that Alex or Azra or I or Tefun suddenly become a type of author, right? And in the act of bringing something back, and I'm not quite sure what kind of author we are, because it's, it's like the return of the author, right? Versus the death of the author. And I would think that it's almost like this anxiety of authorship because you know, I, I am not the designer of, of the mound, Alex is not the designer of the, of the bungalow, you know, Azra is not the, the designer of these, these objects as well that people are bringing in, but somehow our, our work stamps our, our point of view very heavily on the object, which I, I assume is always the case with um, certain preservation efforts. But there's something about experimental preservation that, again, sort of inverts a kind of, um, for me at least, a kind of post-structural thinking about authorship that I find very exciting, but also very anxiety producing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Should, uh, do you like to comment on that? Because I mean, the anxiety produced by the authorship. Yeah, I mean, we had we had, <laughs> we had a particular problem with uh, uh, we didn't want to put into the corner of celebrating the architect of the bungalow. Yeah, so this was uh, this was the first thing we shouldn't tap into. Yeah, because it wasn't it wasn't supposed to be. I mean, Zeb Roof became some kind of a hero yeah, of, of uh, post-war German architecture. So, but this we were very far from that. So. Um, uh, then it would be better if we would be the, would, would be called the authors uh, of this kind of montage, uh, and that that somehow uh, worked well. But our goal was somehow also to to to walk around the kind of uh, question of authorship, um, the the basic question: How can we realize presence in in in, in Venice? Yeah, like how can we not make it a kind of historical. Um, uh, state museum show, yeah. Like, how can we make something that is immediately uh, perceivable and experienceable by the audience? So uh, that, so, so the the question of who actually built the pavilion or who actually built or designed the, the bungalow is no longer relevant at all. So it's really about this kind of before we before the exhibition opened, we were always running around with this one single brick in our hand. Yeah? Because we said, okay, like, is what is this stupid brick telling us? Yeah, can material like speak about the politics and these political gestures that happened in both buildings, or which they were like utilized for? What can this kind of stupid brick? What what is it his responsibility? Of course not. Yeah, and he can also not speak. Of course, but 
It is, yeah, it is this kind of, for us, this kind of material question, this kind of material, physical presence was, was one of the most important things, like to speak, yeah? Not, so not the author of the, or the designer should speak, but this kind of like, what is, so it's also not a kind of rethink, it's kind of presentation, yeah, like the, the question of like, how can we um, make architecture, yeah? I have some very much work there that, uh, as a kind of curator in some way, that you also got the whole kind of uh, pavilion to become on, come on display in some yeah. way. It also become an exhibition object yes. by putting this, uh, so you turn yeah. it around in some way. Yeah, it, it, was, it was funny. At the same time, the German Werkbund, you probably heard about that, <laughs> held an, an, another exhibition outside the Giardini, about 22 new versions are updated versions of this very pavilion, yeah? So they wanted to tear it down and wanted to and ask 22 German architects, so what would be there, like, instead of that building? And it's interesting that to see these two shows then together. But to stay there a bit in Venice, uh, I, well, maybe that's a little bit of a critique, but the car, I mean, the <laughs> why did you brought the car? Because everything was, in some way... The car? Reenacted, but that was the only original, and it's in some way made a, it's it, it made a black hole, I think. In some yeah, way. yeah, we got I, to, I would um, like, oh, can't you just take it away? Yeah, it's gone, <laughs> it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone since <laughs> since July actually, so it's no longer there. But of course, we got scolded a lot for yeah. for bringing the car down there. I mean, whoever thinks we love Mercedes is totally wrong, of course. Yeah, for us, it was kind of completing the scene from the outside. Yeah, because it's. It's two, and it, what you see from the outside is two entrances, yeah, and the the car serves as some kind of a knot between the two buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, yeah, I mean, at it, it, it, first we we were scared that it steals the show, <laughs> and and uh, the Biennale administration uh, thought it was product placement. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, and then of course the kind of naive idea is the same with the lighting up and the firing up of the of the chimney was, okay, we, we do this once in your life and it is a kind of stupid idea to bring a car there, <laughs> to park a car in front of this <laughs> building. But it was also nice, it was, it was next to the flagpole, yeah? So we were asking, the flagpole was already there, we were asking the Biennale whether we can put the car there and then we make a, made a drawing with a flagpole and then the, after two weeks the Biennale responded and said, yeah, you can put the, the car there and you can also put the flagpole there. <laughs> <laughs> which was already there for like 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so the flag, the German flag also became part of the exhibition. Mm. exhibition. And it's funny that uh, for all the, the previous exhibitions, whenever the flag was there, mm. there was huge complaints by Germans saying, this flag cannot be in front of this building. Yeah? So please take it down. <laughs> and it only survived always one day, the German flag in front of this kind of... Uh, um, bad building. <laughs> and then, Astra, you brought up this thing about agency and uh, objects having agency. And I, it should be really nice if you could kind of develop that a bit because that's, I think it's very central in your work. Yes. Well, you saw the, the background mm -hmm. of the work. I mean, it's a very specific uh, political conflict in, in, which, in which I work. So there are dimensions to this work that are applicable to different places, but you know, um, in this context, I think the Bosnian case uh, prompts us to with a range of interesting questions. First is the problem of the museum itself. Um, you know, I mean, museum history. We have to acknowledge inherent uh, power relationships of the museum, its ties to colonial history, to nationalism, and so on. Um, and the problem that is, uh, we are facing now in Bosnia is that you, so to say, as a, as a cultural producer there, you argue for the museum instead of critiquing it because the political context is so um, heavy and difficult and it's a kind of war going on in which we can do something by you know, arguing for the need of that institution itself. Now, what I'm trying to do with um, this notion of agencies to first discover, uncover um, the potential of that discussion. To, like you talk about the museum, but you actually are introducing um, causal effects that after you reframe the discourse in public, um, to have an agency means you introduce 
um, causal effects mm. in, in, in another place um, that could have impact on the state making process because a country, I mean, it is a state, but it's a completely dysfunctional state. Mm -hmm. It's uh, internally divided into two <laughs> political entities and then cantons and then little regions with an insane bureaucratic apparatus. We just had elections and I mean, the whole apparatus is eating away all the money. So the only solution for that uh, resolution of these issues is to have a constitutional reform. But to get there, you can start inspiring people by um, thinking about what kinds of institutions they would actually need. But to get to that question, you need to also question why, you know, it's not about like keeping that museum as it is, but rethinking it for the future by rethinking the meaning of objects too. So uh, the strategy that I'm applying in my work is to um, introduce like uh, sympathy and empathy with heritage through you know, these different kinds of actions and, and like triggering people to think about what these things actually mean to them. So I didn't talk about that one object that I showed a little like hand stitch thing. That's for example, an artifact that my grandmother gave me. All of this was like collected by my grandmothers for me when I get married to you know, inherit all of that stuff. <laughs> it's something that means to me personally, but also many other women in Bosnia have that thing. So it's also part of the kind of collective memory. So it's something that everyone knows, we share it. Once we agree on that type of object that is meaningful and you know, both touches us personally, but it has some kind of shared value, it can become a kind of object of collective value. And then once you bring it to the collection, you can actually uh, see how a collection is made, you know, that there is a decision-making process, that things are not just like thrown into a pile, but there is actually a, a constructed um, process for that. No, but I think a bit that, that the, the, the critique of the museum, the mm -hmm. institutional critique of the museum has always been in some way that museums take away agencies mm -hmm. from objects. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. the, the, and also the, the museums has been used yes. as such, you know, to mm -hmm. take very political objects mm -hmm. and placing them in the museum and they become mm -hmm. historical objects and then become public objects and, you know, they, they, mm -hmm. they move out. They, they, you, you strip them of agency mm -hmm. in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, you kill objects by putting them in a museum <laughs> in some way. Uh, and also that has that kind of critique has also of course been around preservation. So you kill, you know, the mm -hmm. muse you create museum mm -hmm. cities and so on by framing them as preservation. So I think it's very interesting here if you you know, starting in some way to defend the museum. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a also mm -hmm. a, a, a turning around the kind of whole discourse mm -hmm. in some way about museum actually keeping things alive, maybe. Exactly, yeah. so it's an argument for the museum in that sense, mm -hmm. but not in the same sense, because it's a dysfunctional museum mm -hmm. also. I mean, it's, it's, its structure hasn't changed from, I don't know, late 19th century when it was founded. So, um, you know, we do have to push the, the ways it will function, but it has as a kind of symbol as of the state as a sim also an institution for research, education, and preservation, it's needed. So mm -hmm. it's an, really an argument for the needs of these institutions. Mm -hmm. But I, this is not to say to preserve them as such. Uh, I mean, they still have to be rethought. Mm -hmm. And that's why the discussion of the object is important because through the meaning or like revisiting the meanings of objects, because maybe all the stuff that's in there, it doesn't mean anything to the new generation anymore or things have changed. I mean, someone who has put these objects in there, uh, they are from the previous regime, you know, that, that the, the, the exhibitions are framed in a different narrative. What if, so what if the, I mean, with, the, with your projects, one of the things that really struck me was um, uh, the, the use of appropriation, which strikes me as, as um, a, a tenor that a lot of experimental work has, whether you're talking about experimental landscapes or experimental architecture, experimental art, exp you know, in terms of experimental preservation, which I suppose we're here to theorize. I'm curious, you know, how, you know, we, the issue is like, you know, we only saw two of your projects today or two or three. So I'm curious how one might work with archives or work with museums beyond ideas of appropriation, or if, you, if you've thought of that. Hmm. Can you? 
help me out, help me out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I guess I, I mean, referring back to Tortoise's comment, I mean, this idea that you, I think it's really fascinating that you take the archive, you, you take the uh, prohibition to look at objects and you have people appropriate it to, to kind of, for political critique, right, mm -hmm. about critique. So I guess I wonder if, if within this work there might be some second or third evolution of it in which one imagines a, a, a new way in which one can imagine the museum or the archive as having a more liberatory function beyond appropriation. Mm -hmm. So like, is it possible to conceptualize some complete new form of museum, some completely new form of archivization, some, sorry, I shouldn't use the word new, yeah. some alternative form, right? I think this is one of the experiments here yeah. is to, to think about the whole city as a museum mm -hmm. and to say, okay, mm -hmm. maybe we don't need that building as such. There's also a lot of valuable stuff in people's homes. Maybe you need to become a curator. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to mm -hmm. become, you know, how do you take care of it? Yeah. And so this, with this exhibition, is people bring it, they mm -hmm. take a picture, they see how it's done, and they take it back home because I cannot store the stuff. So the archive is also dispersed. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one way of doing it. But the other is also to think about, um, you know, what does that kind of discussion do? I mean, a lot of the, the other work that I do, for example, with the research that I showed at the beginning, yeah. it's something that um, is, you know, contributes to the ongoing um, um, trials in the criminal in the c yeah. tribunal in The Hague, where my research and research of my mentors is, uh, becomes evidence of um, the systematic destruction mm -hmm. and is can become a proof of uh, mm -hmm. the genocide can take place, for example, mm -hmm. with cultural means, mm -hmm. which is something mm -hmm. that in the Bosnian war, the legal definitions of, of the genocide and cultural heritage protection has been also expanded to include um, mm -hmm. yeah, cultural mm -hmm. heritage in that case. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Thank you for um, a wonderful presentation. It's uh, so interesting to have four people talk about this subject and then we start to see similarities. And uh, it's also really nice to sort of make you uh, experimental preservationist. So you're, you're taking the role, like these are the future experimentalists. And I think the, the, the role of, because you're, um, all of you sort of stepped out of your maybe Comfort, comfort zone in a way that you, were, you said that you were amateur historian and you said you were a future archaeologist. <laughs> so you were, to be able to do your work, you seem to have a need to define yourself other than you are, that your position. And I think that's, it really is interesting to, or maybe that has um, a power. We have to do that to be able to actually experiment in a way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, and my thought was that we have to invent that I mean it's probably a very you know, uh, vaguely defined role but it's really interesting to see that you are now impersonating this new new role we have to invite new schools we have to yeah. make new professions and so on so um, could you I mean maybe um, you could explain that uh, or, or elaborate a little bit on, on the fact that you're stepping into, uh, you're an amateur stepping into the historian yeah. and, uh, and what that insecurity inserted into the work or maybe your experience after this. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, that's, that's an that's a important question for me also being being like it's like a practical question of being also inside an institution, yeah. Like uh, as a as an architect, as an as a designer, yeah, or even more like an urban designer than anything like an historian. So now stepping out of that creates some kind of uh, disciplinary difficulties, which is um, which which would also be my question about this kind of um, topic. Could this ever be a kind of discipline yeah, on its own? Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, this is the, the qu biggest question is like, uh, then what is the mode of operation we are, we, we are working? Yeah? Like already like, how serious is that? Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, we know like when I, when I heard experimental preservation, uh, then I thought like, why don't they call it his experimental history? Yeah? But then experimental history, like uh, uh, kind of, um, I, I think of these guys who, who say, 
what if, uh, um, if something didn't happen or if, yeah, if, mm. if Lenin is, was still alive or whatsoever. This is, this is, kind, this of is kind of, yeah, this is mm. kind of stupid, isn't it? <laughs> or, <laughs> or at least it, it, it, sometimes it's funny, but also like also the, the kind of the issue of irony, for example. Yeah? All of these projects somehow contain a little bit of irony, yeah. And uh, that's that's in a, in some way it's very powerful, yeah. And of course the car, yeah, again, <laughs> is is uh, is for us was for us the only thing where we weren't dead serious, yeah? Like, with the kind of material. The, the columns were out of, out, of, out of steel and not out of wood. So everything was real, and suddenly this car, yeah? Mm. So this was our little escape out of this kind of uh, super serious endeavor of doing a kind of reconstruction. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether mm. something like irony has a place in some kind of, in, in an architectural school, or, yeah. Mm. Maybe it's also not irony, but it's, it's mm. kind of, it's a general question of how we operate in this kind of, new discipline. Mm. Well, I think that this is a really interesting point also relating to this question of creativity. When yeah. you're working with, with objects that are so historically charged and in a sense overdetermined with meaning, yeah. bring in this, this freedom you know, to work outside of your comfort zone, but also to move these objects outside of their comfort zone mm -hmm. and to begin to um, question the overdeterminacy, you know, of of the meanings that associated with them, and provide a little bit more of a openings mm -hmm. of possibilities. I think that was really wonderful in all the projects. That it's a really fascinating thing to see irony and humor mm -hmm. being brought into preservation uh, in this way. I mean, it's what a wonderful thing. You know, it's the one thing we've never actually worked with. You know, and um, you because when we talk about preservation, everybody gets very serious, <laughs> you know? This is a really important yeah. thing. And, and, and we don't like to say creativity because we feel it's sort of like if your banker is getting creative, you know? There's a, there's a, there's a crisis <laughs> looming somewhere, you know, if, the minute that you start messing with the books. So uh, I just, I really love that in, in, in the projects and, um, and, and the playfulness of imagination. I think that you brought to to um, to the discussion is really fascinating too. I mean, with this idea of the, for example, these practices, you know, engaging various modes of practice, the replica, the copy. I mean, it emerges in each of these projects in a different way, and with a different understanding of temporality. I mean, I love the idea instead of a reenactment of a retroactivement, you know, where you're <laughs> sort of coming back from the future, which is a sort mm -hmm. of science fiction, and in some ways the idea, very idea of preservation is science fiction, right? I mean, you could say, when we were said it's an art and a science, you could say it's, an, it's, a, it's the yeah. fiction of science in some way. In the last uh, discussion, we talked about pseudoscience a lot. But um, anyway, you know, I, I think that this is a, a, a fantastic uh, opening up of all these questions. I am reminded of the time, so I think that we should, uh, let those that are hungry go uh, and and t take care of biological, you know, <laughs> necessities, and not just feed them, feed the mind. We will be hanging around for you know some time, so we can continue this discussion here. But I just want to thank everyone uh, at, at, at Studio X, at uh, Marina, uh, uh, Gavin, uh, Selva, who's not here. Uh, Eric, Tortoise, everybody that came together to make this happen and, mo and, and especially our speakers for, for making the long journey here to share your work with us and all of you that, um, uh, that came out to, to participate in this. Please stand and, and bring your questions down to the floor. Let's, we, we, let's talk about it in a less formal setting. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.